Let's write to the member from University of Rosedale. It's now time for member statements. The member from Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Over two millennia ago, the Greek philosopher Socrates is quoted as saying, the really wise man is the man who realizes how little he knows, and the unexamined life is not worth living. Even though he said these things millennia ago, this is wisdom that can guide all of us. November 17th was World Philosophy Day. The United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, created an international day in 2005 to highlight the importance of philosophy, stating that philosophy is a discipline that encourages critical and independent thought and is capable of working towards a better understanding of the world and promoting tolerance and peace. The day is celebrated on the third Thursday of every November and provides a unique occasion to mark the enduring value of philosophy and human thought, our institutions, and our own lives. Within Ontario's world-class post-secondary institutions continue to advance our understanding of logic, epistemology, culture, the human condition, ethics, and reality, and the spirit of philosophy is alive and well all across the province. We're better equipped to make decisions that affect our lives and help others when we think critically and meaningfully about what we seek to do. Another quote, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. This quote is commonly attributed to Aristotle, but actually is from the American writer Will Durant. And what did they both have in common? Both were philosophers. I hope everyone takes this opportunity to mark World Philosophy Day by cracking open a new book about the challenges and thinking. Thank you, Speaker. Amir didn't want to die, yet he had no choice but to begin the process of getting approved for medically assisted suicide because he's living in poverty on ODSP and was about to lose the rooming house he lived in. He is a disabled man, living with excruciating, untreatable back pain, but the stress of becoming homeless was too much to bear. Tracy found herself in a similar situation, with disability support being too low to survive on. Once an able-bodied chef, she faced debilitating impact of long COVID that made it impossible for her to continue to work. Seeking maid was an exclusive financial consideration for her. There are many others like Amir and Tracy. A disability may be present at birth, could be caused by an accident, or developed over time. Point is, it could be anyone. And if you find yourself in that situation, the system you face is one where you are provided so little, the rates are so low, that it becomes impossible to survive. You're constantly worried about where your next meal will come from, how much longer you can keep a roof over your head. You become so desperate that you begin to consider medically assisted suicide. That's how it is right now. What does this say about ODSP, where death is the preferred choice? We have to fix this. The NDP keeps proposing solutions, but you keep voting it down. Please, I ask you, work with us so people don't have to die and instead can live with dignity. Member from Burlington. Good morning, Speaker. I rise this morning to recognize the amazing Burlington Symphony Orchestra. On November 12th, I was honored to attend the 50th anniversary of the Burlington Symphony Orchestra at the Burlington Performing Arts Centre. The performance was an incredible replica of the orchestra's inaugural concert that took place on November 29, 1973. The orchestra performed Beethoven's Overture to Prometheus, the first piece ever performed by the BSO, and included a stunning violin concerto beautifully executed by Ian Ye, along with Bruckner's Symphony No. 4. The Burlington Symphony Orchestra is a community-based volunteer orchestra that gives mu musicians a place to share their passion for orchestral music and strengthens community engagement through outreach programs such as the Youth Artist Competition. The Burlington Orchestra started off as the McMaster Symphony Orchestra, a campus community orchestra. The orchestra maintains its original objectives from 1973 which are to perform symphonic music of high quality, to stimulate excellence in instrumental performance, and to support, improve, and expand musical opportunities 
for Hamilton and Burlington regions. The Burlington Symphony Orchestra fills an important cultural role within our city, and I'm happy to have been able to experience the talent of the incredible youth in our, our, our community produces. So congratulations to the Burlington Symphony Orchestra on 50 years. Member from Windsor. Thank you, Speaker. I want to welcome the OPSU CEFPO members joining us today at Queen's Park for their Mental Health and Addictions Lobby Day. There is a mental health and addiction epidemic across Ontario. OPSU CEFPO members and Ontarians in general are concerned about the lack of access to mental health and addiction services. Many Ontarians can't access mental health or addictions care until they reach a crisis point. All roads continue to lead to the emergency room or death. While emergency rooms consistently face crisis levels and aren't equipped to provide appropriate mental health or addictions care, people have no option but to go to the ER when they need urgent mental health care. Many people are discharged without access to care because it either doesn't exist or it isn't covered by OHIP. Hospitals are facing understaffing, unprecedented high volumes and wait times, and some have had to close their ERs temporarily. The Conservative government chips away at our mental health system, purposely weakening it to push their pro-privatization agenda. Many Ontarians can't afford to pay for therapy. Waitlists for publicly funded mental health or addiction care are months to years long and services are limited. Community service agencies are worn thin due to persistent underfunding. Mental health care is health care. Ontarians need and deserve access to publicly funded psychotherapy and counselling. People with substance misuse struggles should be able to access treatment as soon as they ask for support. The government must make major investments into the publicly funded, publicly delivered health care Ontarians need. It's time to fix the broken mental health and addiction system to have true universal health care in Ontario because lives depend on it. The member from Brampton West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. At a time when inflation has reached the highest levels in four decades, we know families are feeling the pressure from rising prices on everything from gas to groceries. During these challenging economic times, it is the government's responsibility to continue to bring forth legislation that will support the people of Ontario by putting more money back into their pockets. Speaker, that is why the government of Ontario is set to extend the provincial gas tax cut for another year. The provincial gas tax was reduced by 5.7 cents in the, per litre in the summer and was set to expire on December 31st. Extending the gas tax cut for another year provides businesses and drivers with some relief. The gas tax cut reduces the cost of fuel by 5.3 cents per litre, which means the average household will save an estimated total of $195 between July 1, 2022 and December 31, 2023. And Speaker, we know that in times like this, we continue to do everything in our power to support the hardworking people and families of Ontario. And this is yet another example of the provincial government's ongoing commitment to keeping costs down for families and businesses, such as permanently removing tolls on Highway 412 and 418 and eliminating the license plate sticker renewal fee. Thank you, Speaker. The member from Toronto, St. Paul. Conservative bills 23 and 39 have nothing to do with creating more deep, real, affordable housing. They will strip our democracy, silence conservation authorities, as well as progressive city councillors, and they attack natural resources, effectively ripping up the green belt during a climate crisis. The green belt is more than a piece of land. It is an ecosystem of wetlands, wildlife habitats, and essential biodiversity that are vital in our fight against climate change. Tearing up this ecosystem only paves us further down the path to climate catastrophe. This cannot be undone. Our children will be hit the hardest. In fact, it is already weighing on their mental health. I've met with education workers and teachers with OSSTF District 12 in my riding who told me how their students are riddled with climate anxiety. I've heard it straight from the mouths of our kids in St. Paul's. They're worried about their futures, about water injustice, flooding, noise pollution, air quality. They're presenting with more allergies, respiratory infections, and chemical sensitivities. I urge this Conservative government to take real action on climate change. Keep your hands off the green belt. That's a start. No amount of profit is worth costing a child their future. Thank you very much, Speaker. The, man, the member from Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Thank you, Speaker. I would like to take this chance to wish good luck to all the municipal 
members who have been elected in my writing, many of them had been, uh, have been sworn in last week. Elections have passed, but now we have to start working. Municipal leaders have a very important role to play. They have to represent the voice of citizens. And we are responsible towards the people who elected us. So to those who have just been elected, if every end of the day you can see that you've done your best, mission accomplished. So again, I congratulate you. I'm sure that you'll represent your electors very well. And I'm proud to be your member of parliament. Thank you. Member statement. Member statement. Thank you. The member from Peterborough, Quartha. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Way back in the fall of 2019, the Ontario Legislature hosted a special day for my Peterborough Lakers senior lacrosse team <laughs> as a tribute for their third straight Canadian National Lacrosse Championship. All of Peterborough was anxiously waiting for the 2020 season to begin. The Lakers were once again the odds-on favourite to repeat as the MSL champions and represent the East at the Man Cup. Of course, all of us know what happened in 2020, and the season was cancelled. Then in 2021, with COVID rearing its ugly head once again, the season was cancelled. But this past summer, we were able to have a lacrosse season here in Ontario and at West. And after a two-year hiatus because of COVID, Peterborough was in a position for an unprecedented four-peat. All that stood in the way of my Lakers was the Langley Thunder. It was a hard-fought seven-game series at the Peterborough Memorial Centre, with my Lakers once again capturing a fourth consecutive Man Cup. Hey. An unprecedented second four-peat. No other city in Canada has ever won the Man Cup four times in a row, and we have done it twice, ensuring that the Peterborough Century 21 Lakers are the centre of the lacrosse universe. I'd like to give a special shout out to uh, Megan Dykeman, the MLA from Langley, BC, for being a good sport and wearing one of our Lakers jerseys in the BC Legislature after losing the bet with me. And I look forward to hosting another Lakers Day here at Queen's Park, where all of you will be welcome to come get your picture taken with the Man Cup and meet some of the players on the world's greatest lacrosse team. Yeah. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Scarborough, Guildwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is an honour to rise on behalf of my constituents of Scarborough, Guildwood. It is with concern that I rise today to acknowledge an issue which has been deepening all across the province. For months now, alarming stories and scenes from hospitals and emergency rooms have caused Ontarians to turn their attention to our health care system. Even just last week, we had mothers with babies on the grounds of Queen's Park. With increasing urgency, questions are being asked about how it is being funded and staffed. Now, with winter setting in and hospitals facing a perfect storm of COVID-19, flu and other respiratory illnesses, stories like that of Jasmine, a mother whose four-year-old child with Down syndrome spent close to 40 hours waiting in an ER for a bed, waiting in the hallway where she lay on two chairs pushed together to form a makeshift bed. This shows how our health care system is worsening. In my own community of Scarborough Guildwood, residents have reported packed hallways, difficulties being seen by a doctor, and a number of cases being turned away at triage, with a few, um, with, with a few urgent cases being transferred. This is unacceptable, and responsibility for what is happening lies squarely with the Premier and his government. Whether it's Jasmine's family or my residents in Scarborough Guildwood, these vulnerable Ontarians need the help and support of their government. What their stories tell us is that the government has a duty to do what it should have done at the start of the pandemic, increase supports to meet these unprecedented needs, fast-track provincial supports for hospitals and health networks, like a new hospital for Scarborough Guildwood, and 
repealing Bill 124 to address the urgent staffing shortages. Speaker, the people of Ontario must not be made to wait any longer, especially if they are four years old, having pneumonia, and are sitting in a hallway for 40 hours. Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in the House today to recognize the incredible work of the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario. Like many other cities in Ontario, Richmond Hill seniors' population is growing rapidly. Many seniors are struggling with dementia and other forms of this life-changing illness. I can still recall the dilemma Florence faced when her grandfather disappeared on her. He cannot speak much English and is totally lost when he is on the street alone. Florence's family is very grateful for the Finding Your Way program. It is supported by the Ontario government and delivered all across Ontario by the Alzheimer's Society. This program is very important because it recognizes that it takes all of us working together to help keep our seniors safe. I want to end by sharing an amazing statistic with you. More than one million people have benefited from the Finding Your Way program through the tools and seminars it offers. That's truly a marvelous thing. When so many people coming together and help care and nurture our seniors, we are helping to make a difference of the people in Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. That concludes our member statements for this morning. Introduction of visitors, the member for Waterloo.